So if you're into generative music, you are probably aware of The Turing Machine by Tom Wheatwell from Music Thing Modular. Tom is my guest for today's conversation, and actually today's conversation was not recorded today or last week or last month. It was recorded a couple of months ago or a bit longer when I just started and I had that idea of making podcasts or like small lessons about user experience design and interviewing experts in the process. And so in this conversation, we're talking about different products. Uh, Tom is actually showing the complete process of how the Turing machine was uh, created from the spark of an idea to all doing all the electronics and working in breadboards and then to the final interfaces that it had until the final point. And it's pretty interesting to see how things have developed since 2012 when Tom just started with DIY and built his own synths. Anyway, without further ado, I'm Rui, this is the Synth Design Podcast, and this is Tom Wheatwell from Music Thing Modular. Oh, and please do like, subscribe, comment, and share because you know, that's how the internet works and that's the only way that we can get more people to know about this. Thanks. The most entertaining part of it is quite an incandescent light bulb box. So Sorry, the, the most entertaining it, part? It has, it has an incandescent light bulb on it, like it was a filament. Uh, a little tiny miniature, exactly the same as a mini mug has on the front panel. Um, so that, in, in many ways, is the most notable thing about it, rather than an LED. It's got that of finding those in stock and that kind of stuff was an element that slowed that down. But fundamentally, that was a kind of couple of weekends to design that, send it off for a prototype. I can't remember if there, there, was, there was one or two little mistakes on that prototype. So that's it. You know, it's, it's not an enormous chunk of investment time. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be a very cheap, very. It'll be. A, a be. It's interesting how it will fit. I think into the sort of range of products in that it's really simple. I think it's very desirable because it's entertaining and it sounds great and looks cool. Um, but it's also a really good kind of first soldering project. It'd be great for kind of workshops or. You know, I often get asked, what can I make first? This will be a good answer for that because the majority of the components are just little um, surface mount components on it. So it's really a kind of nice first thing to assemble it. It's got some kind of weird mechanical bits in it because of this weird light on it. Um, uh, so there's something to do, uh, but not a great deal. So it's a kind of quick, nice, I, and I would hope the vast, vast majority of people get it, make it quickly, go, oh, that's fun, and then they're on the journey. Um, so that is a very, very simple project that um, goes from beginning to end. Uh, at the other end of the scale, um, I've been doing this little kind of eight fader MIDI controller thing that's like slightly smaller than a credit card. It's again, it's not something that should be complicated or difficult. You know, it's a it's literally some faders and a microcontroller and a couple of LEDs and a, but it's kind of grown now. So it has a memory on it, it has an accelerometer on it, so you can tilt it like that. It's got six buttons around it that are very specific and expensive and weird little tiny buttons. Uh, and it's got all this code in it. And again, the code isn't fundamentally really complicated, um, but it has to interact with a web editor. So I've had to modify that editor. So it's just taken like a ludicrously long amount of time through a ludicrous number of variations and that one by ludicrous i mean it would have taken probably it would be getting on for kind of two years now and it's not shipped now and it's not going to ship for a little while um so yeah it can it can take a long time the other thing, but that's kind of almost continuous process all the way through it's not like i'm working on it full time but it's 
somebody I something I've been thinking, this is good, I like this, I want to finish this for that whole duration. Um, there are lots of other things where I have an idea, do something on it, get bored, get stuck, something stops it, and then I, that sits in a drawer for for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. And then sometimes you then go back to it and you're like, oh, okay, now there's something there. Um, and often it's just like stupid things. Like I've got, I've got one of those things that I've been working on for, for years that really isn't very complicated. But I then went back and looked at it again last year, did a whole other prototype, didn't really quite work got bored of that so, so you know and because it's not it's, a, it's an idea that's sort of um it's not like an easy obvious straightforward idea where i'm like if i put this out i can sell this for you know 50 60 quid as a kit and lots of people with euro record want to buy it it's a much more it's basically an idea where i could put it out and sell it for like 60 70 pounds and you could buy a thing that does the same thing from an electronics shop for like 30 pounds but the electronics shop version is done at scale my one is done small which means you know that's one of the reasons why i haven't kind of gone back to it it doesn't have a it doesn't have a really clear like reason why it should exist which is probably why it hasn't quite existed yet yeah if you're thinking about these uh, couple of projects that you just uh, thought about, is there, do you define any constraints so the project won't, uh, won't get too long or won't be like, um, you know, as a creator, I can imagine the, the perfectionist in you is always trying to like, can I just add just this and another this? And Yeah, that, well, there's, there's the projects you take on in the first place. So there's ideas I've had that I thought I would quite like, but then you just look at it and go, I just, I just know that's going to be a nightmare. I don't want to get into doing that. You know, I had an idea for some kind of a huge like guitar pedal with a load of analog synth circuits in it. And I just thought that would be a cool thing to have, but then like whole synthesizer, several synthesizer companies have gone bust in the past trying to do that. <laughs> you know, EMS, I think, really suffered when they did their synth, the high fly, uh, and ARP almost went bust trying to make a kind of guitar synthesizer. And mine isn't anything as complicated or sophisticated as those. That's just like, I quite like it. I wouldn't like it that much. And I just kind of know I would make it and then it would be something you wouldn't actually use that much. Yeah. So that's a good one that kind of really spend that one working on that. Um, there's other things like I've always been, I've always been really intrigued by um, matrix mixes and matrix switching because of feedback and you know that whole notion of those kind of that that kind of device I found really interesting um and have looked at that lots and lots of different times to try and work out what would be interesting in that space so I looked at kind of you know a kind of computer controlled four by four matrix mix that's basically 16 DCAs and trying to think of interesting ways of controlling those levels, uh, ways of doing big like eight by eight matrix switches. Um, but again, I, don't, I mean, I've done lots, and it may, it may come to something eventually. But I think the, the question there is around an interface that's useful and pleasing and fun. And I think that's the real challenge because what I what I don't want is like it's a little matrix and you've got a cursor and you can move it up and down and turn the switch on and off and that's the thing. Um, but equally, I wonder if the kind of interesting visual semi-random mixing 
is actually that useful. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of imagining like a sort of shuffler. Mm -hmm. But again, I can imagine making that, it'd be quite big, it'd be quite complicated, it'd be quite expensive. And to use it in like Eurorack, you then have to patch like 16 cables into it if we did anything. And I just feel like, mm. I just don't, and other people have done them and they don't seem to be, you know, really, I've never bought one, which suggests something about it. Um, so that's one of those things where you just think, you know, there's something interesting there, um, but I haven't quite worked out what it might be yet. Do you start working from the interface, from the interaction, or is it from the electronics <laughs> or the circuits? It's sort of... It's kind of all, all at once sometimes. I mean, it's... I mean, like with that that mini drive thing, I can really remember looking at um, Instagram and uh, Sound Gas, I think, you know, that kind of crazy vintage gear shop in England. They've made these, um, uh, it's a reproduction of the old Grampian Spring Reverb units that like, um, Lee Perry would use, whatever. And that has a big, chunky incandescent light on the front that you see flashing when they demonstrate it. And I remember watching that band. It was cool. I quite like one of those. <laughs> and then I thought, well, the place that's really interesting for that is um, a mini mode. And I've never owned a mini mode, but that, that feedback loop that's in them where you can feed the output back in before the, um, after the filter or before the things before the filter. Um, always seems really nice and on the emulations of it I've used. That's a really nice thing that you want to, to do. So I was like, hang on, why don't I just make that bit? That's the interesting bit. Uh, and it wouldn't be cool with a little light flashing on it. <laughs> um, so then like, the interface was pretty straightforward. I could kind of imagine that quite quickly. Uh, I did a little bit of work with um, the actual kind of inputs and outputs and stuff because it was, you know, I wanted to make feedback patching kind of easier. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I must have done that on, I think I did that on breadboard. I can't, I can't remember. Um, and then when I got the thing, back i was like wow this sounded really good you know, this is actually quite a fun you know it just does sound really interesting um, you mean back like as uh, sending it uh, when i got the, the the prototype boards back because okay. often now if it's at all complicated i will just make prototype boards um not populated i know that emily when she does stuff she i always thought it seems very luxury is that she will design something send it off, get the boards back, and never does the kind of population herself, uh, which I would definitely aspire to, but it is quite expensive to do that. And you have to be as confident as I'm sure she is when she sends them off, it's really going to work. Whereas I just would be too too sad <laughs> if I'd spent like 500 pounds and had these properly beautifully populated boards and then put them in the like didn't do anything. <laughs> That would make me really sad. Uh, so I send them off and it costs like 30, 40 pounds or something for a small board. Yeah. So that comes back and then I populate it um, and then you plug it in and see if it does what you're expecting it to do. I mean, obviously it depends. There are some circuits that are very reliant on, um, on the electronics and then you are more, I'm more likely to then breadboard it and you know, try and figure it out. Um, so, so I suppose the answer to your question is it's really different and the thing I really like about the process is that it is very kind of multi-layered so that you know the best part of the process is when you're sort of simultaneously sort of sketching out maybe a panel prototyping something maybe in something digital like in pure data or something uh, researching it to find out what other people have done, making sure it's not doing the same thing as them, 
uh, building something on breadboard, starting to sketch the actual circuit board in Eagle to find out whether it's going to fit and make sense. All of those things you're doing kind of simultaneously, and that's a really nice, exciting period. And then you get stuck into like 18 months of writing tedious code because you're not really writing code. <laughs> And you invested so much time in your life, which is really finished this now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's very, very, very kind of round and round and round. Yeah. So, so the do you have any uh, sketches you could show uh, on the screen? Like examples? Yeah. Of so, maybe, uh, maybe a bit more complex, I guess, that the, uh, the mini drive is fairly simple. Yeah, or maybe you I had can... some iterations for it? Well, I can take, no, I'll take you through, because um, I've got some images here I can share that. The, with the Turing machine, when I did that, they kind of take you through the different stages of that. So um, let me just share my screen and kind of flick some of these out. Um, can you see that? Yep. Okay, so, so the, the sort of Turing machine, which is a, a random looping sequencer. So the idea was to have a sequencer that was random but was controllable in some way um and so the kind of inspiration for that lots lots of people have done these kind of sequences so um i'd be looking at kind of what was out there so you've got the the book of 266 is the sort of two middle parts of those are quite um actually three three middle chunks of that are all that same sort of idea of shift registers, sequences that you can you can manipulate in certain ways. The uh, triad X muse, which is the triangular thing on the right, was again exactly the same thing of these sort of chains of lo long strings of sort of semi-random binary, basically. Uh, and the clay, which was that sequence on the left, which is a classic sort of DIY project from the olden days. Um, and Ken Stone's Gated Comparator are all similar sort of things. And they're all kind of projects where you can look at the look at the circuits, try and make sense of them, try and see what, what they're doing, how they're working. Um, similarly, actually get yeah, bits of the, the Rungler in Rob Hordick's thing, uh, the noise ring. Um, and so I was looking at, all of those and, and started trying to build something like that. So this was a breadboard for that, where you've got um, kind of a couple of shift registers at the bottom. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how it works. I think probably the bottom right is probably a clock input circuit, I would have thought. I think I'll clock on there. And then I had this whole thing at this point with switching. So the idea was to kind of switch things in and switch things out and maybe press buttons to kind of write bits into it and write bits out of it. Um, but was just really kind of experimenting with it, trying to get some sense of, trying to get something that worked in a way that seemed interesting. Um, and so a quicker way of doing that than doing that within uh, a breadboard was doing it in software. So this was using the um, Nord G2 uh, demo software. So this is the old Nord modular, but they have a demo version. And in that, they have shift registers, they have inverters, they have switches, they have noise generators, which is kind of all the things that you needed to make what I was working on. So you could kind of prototype it here very quickly and just listen to it and say, does this sound like like I want it to sound? Or is this, is this interesting to play with? Um, doing stuff on paper. So this was kind of, again, you, by this stage, you're starting to, you quite quickly start to see lots of different things that you can do. Um, so like in this one, you can see I've got, right in the middle there, I've got two... DAC, digital audio, uh, digital analog converters, T1 
two outputs. So this idea of this kind of string of binary. And if you had two outputs, then they would be, it would be like a canon. They would be, one would be like four nodes behind the other one or something. So you think, oh, okay, that might be interesting. Start to try and sketch kind of an interface. What, what might this be? But all the way feeling quite un, unconvinced by this, really. Um, and start to sort of put things together, start to think about what what might they be. And it's, it's kind of important to do on these different levels because until you put it like this, you can't really tell how big something will actually be, which I think is really important. It depends. It, it, it's, it's a factor for how how it's going to feel kind of in the real world. You can get, you can spend a long time in, in sort of prototypes and mock-ups and end up with something with like 20 knobs on it to do anything useful. And that's not something you want to do. There's a great picture of um, Rob Hordyke when he was developing the um, the Blippu box, I think. There's a version of it that's like massive. It's this enormous box with loads of different controls on it and he basically built this full-scale prototype but with twice as many controls as the finished one so you could then play with that for a long period and really work out which controls were useful and which ones weren't um so and, and all the while you're doing this you're kind of doing this kind of multi-level research at the same time so this is part of that docker 266 um, schematic and I, I found it really amazing personally as you gradually get to the point where you can look at something like this and I can, could start to make sense of bits of it like I could start to see what that little row of five triangles across the middle was actually doing and why it, what it what it would be for and why that would be interesting and you you know you don't understand all of it but you start to understand these little elements of it, which is so exciting for me, because when you first look at something like this, it is so incomprehensible and so just mysterious as a kind of artifact. So being able to gradually over time start to read, make sense of some of this. Um, and so then I, I, as that process went on, doing lots and lots of different kind of iterations, uh, one evening, I remember kind of looking at it and getting to this point where I sort of figured out there was some way of doing a a kind of smooth, smooth shift from fully random to not random, basically. And that was one of the things I've been sort of thinking about. What I had to do, and that meant my kind of breadboard that I rolled to this stage where it has a has a big knob in the middle. And that big knob was was figuring this out and going, well, could that work? And then making a the little circuit. And at that point, you then had, I had this circuit that I could then connect up to a to an oscillator and smoothly turn from kind of repetitive to random. And suddenly it was like, oh, okay, now this is this is interesting. This is much more interesting than the than the switching and the more kind of deliberate stuff I was doing before, I, I could immediately felt that, that that was something really interesting. Um, so you then go from the breadboard back to the sketch. Uh, and this was then the sketch quite early on, uh, where I'm, I'm really intrigued as to what chaos trigger might have been, because that's a really good name for an input, but I can't remember what chaos trigger was supposed to do. Mm. Um, but apart from Chaos Trigger, this is basically pretty much what became uh, Turing Machine. That was basically what the idea was. So it kind of, that's the sort of idea process, which in many ways is the most fun, fun part of it, going from look at this rough area to you need to add something, you need to find something that's distinctive, something that makes it worth, worth your while playing with it, making it happen. To then, okay, that's 
kind of the thing I want to do. And then once you've got that defining thing, that's what propels you through the kind of tedious bit, which is the, okay, now how do I actually make this happen? How do I actually solve the boring problems? How do I, um, you know, send off three or four prototypes that come back and don't quite work and just... <laughs> fixing the you know, adding anything clever, you're just you're just fixing broken bread stripes, nothing. So you need that kind of if you're doing it, I guess if you're doing it professionally, you're like, well, it's my job. That's what I need to do. I don't care what I'm gonna do. But even then, I would imagine, you know, the the, the you need that that inciting drive to kind of keep you going through the process. Yeah, the resilience. <laughs> yeah. To actually yeah. go through the the challenging moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I was doing this, it, I was very, very inexperienced. I'd done, you know, I was learning how to use um, PCB software at this stage, um, trying to, you know, which is which is a massive learning curve. Um, trying to sort of figure out how you would get this so you could publish it in some way and how you could open source it, how you could make, make something that people would want and that they could use themselves. Yeah. Just trying to do that all, all at the same time. Is there is there a like when when is that moment that you start testing testing with other people that are not you? Um I think that maybe that's something that's changed in that in that when I was doing this festival, there was no money at all there. You know, it was literally, I'm going to, I want this thing. I personally feel it's exciting. So there are no expectations at all as well. So like if if two people on a forum had said, yeah, this looks cool, then I would have been really pleased and I would be, be good and you know and still am in lots of ways with those things um you know i'm always i'm always surprised when things there's, there's definitely lots of things that i will just do because i want them uh and steve at point will generally say well i'll make some of these and i'm always surprised and delighted when he's like oh we're doing another run of those do you is there anything we need to change that's sort of thing because uh, i actually sold them all um but i i will do you know beta testing now because i'm more concerned about publishing something that is is wrong as a you know mistake on it there's slightly more consequences on that or if there's something that seems clear to me but is really confusing to someone else I, I will do that. And certainly with, with the, um, the startup, that very small kind of clock next to the thing, I did a small, perfect, I did a small kind of beta test with that. And there were definitely elements about the way I explain that to people and some elements about some of the sort of the clock parts of it where I was... I was like, okay, I thought this, but, but, in, but much more it would be things where I thought something was interesting. People reported that it was interesting. You know, you send it to them, they go, oh, this is really clever. But I just wasn't convinced it was actually something really useful. So I would take features out for that. So there was a whole like, there was a whole like Euclidean mode in the clock for that. But mm. the interface was so, so limited and so tiny with two buttons. You can press a hold. I just didn't want to get into like hold down the buttons for ten seconds and then it shifts into this mode and then do three taps here and two taps. Oh, I would I would not use it. Hideous. No, exactly. Um, so, and even if you don't use it, it adds complexity and means there's more risk that something else won't work. So, so it was always trying to just yeah take things like that. But I am very bad for fundamentally not being customer centric. <laughs> We're aware of my really, anti customer centricity failings. 
That, that really clashes with the way that I, I mean, I really, I look at your work and I also look at the way that you describe things now. Uh, it seems like, yeah, maybe intuitively you think about the target audience. Um, yeah. So it might not be the conventional way of like, hey, I'm just uh, going to make like a quick sketch here and then I'm going to show it to a few people and then I'm going to develop further. I mean, that is something that I noticed that, yeah, in the digital space we do very often, but in uh, the more... Uh, uh, synth designers I talk to they're like yeah you like I, I remember I talked to uh, to Mang Chi and he was right away like you first have to build something that you can play yeah. and it's kind of obvious like right I mean you cannot just make a sketch of it you could come up with an idea uh, on paper or on, on the computer but without having an actual thing you could test like what you just described with the that... example of uh, Rob Hordyke yeah. Yeah, yeah I would say that's not being customer centric. Showing, showing somebody something and having their opinion, I couldn't care less about their opinion because they're not. I, I care greatly whether they will get value from it and they will use it and they will enjoy it. Absolutely, I, I very much, I really want them to get the most from it. Yeah, I want them to buy it and use it and keep it, and it to solve problems for them it to work. I'm not especially interested in whether they glance at a sketch of it and think it's nice. Because often there's definitely things I've designed where you show a picture of somebody, they go, oh, that's great, that's really cool. And I'm like, sure, but it's not, I, I don't I don't believe that it's right, that it solves a real problem or is is not. So I think I think that's where I think, you know, I could be much more um, you know, really getting stuff out to people like six months before something comes out and then you know much as much as Emily has it you know the, the time that she will take doing these things you know will be a really really long process as I saw when when I worked with her on the um on ears which mm -hmm. was developed from from the thing I designed mm -hmm. but just I was kind of amazed at the length of time in that process so you know she sent me kind of a prototype and I'd be like yeah this looks great it's good and two years later, it hasn't come out. <laughs> not because it's not right, it's because she's fiddling with the pattern on the surface or she's optimizing it or she's got other things. I don't know what, you know, but I'm not suggesting it's a lack of a lack of hard work. I'm suggesting it's this kind of commitment and this yeah. sort of focus on it. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think you to really be, I think the other way of being really customer focused is is just having that community. So I think when you see, you know, someone like Bafaco, where they have, well, as you did in the olden days when we could go out, they 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 would have sessions every week, with people coming in and building stuff. That I think will have given them an amazing kind of confidence and understanding about their audience that I don't have because I'm not. With them all the time. Similarly, Andrew, um, non-linear non circuits in Australia. Mm -hmm. You know, he has an amazing community, um, and you know, they're just not kind of understanding what he's into. But also, he's got this kind of speed and this process and this expertise that I think is amazing. He's he is almost like a kind of media cycle. You know, it's like he's publishing something every month. I think maybe I don't know if he does it all the time now, or if he, if he's, he may well still be doing exactly his really big um, builder events in Perth, and so every month he has to have something new because he's got people coming. I think that's that's absolutely brilliant. You know, that's like uh, you know having that cycle of we're going to put it out, going to put it out, put it out, um, and see what sticks and what people enjoy and what people pick up on is another really nice way of doing it. Yeah, so so the research is really involving the user um, that you have in mind. Uh, obviously, yeah. it starts from from your point of view, your your own interest. But then, yeah, the way that he does it um, sort of, I guess, accelerates the the development process. It makes it a bit more. Well, it's just it's a bit different. I think he's also got that. You know, he's got such a process down. You know, he he's got you know a grid he's got this massive analog electronics expertise so i think he's able to very quickly iterate on things so he will be like 
this one seems to work. Let's try it, but with three of them. Or let's mm-hmm. try this. Or here's a here's a um, an old paper from the 1960s. I can take that and I can map that across the current components, and we put it out. And if 50 people make it, that's great. If 500 people make it, that's great. But you've got that that sort of iteration, kind of build, measure, learn kind of thing. That's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about the time, uh, the, the time span that you are working on, um, on a project, like what would be the first time that you feel like I should actually test this now? This is, this is good enough to test. What do you actually need to have in your hand when you test something? For me personally, I would, to be at all serious, I would need to be able to send somebody a thing that, that works mm-hmm. for me um, because otherwise you're just getting their their opinions about it you know I'd want somebody to have it and to be able to play with it for a few weeks and get a real you know to use it um, so I'm just doing that at the moment with that little fader thing um, which because it's got so much software and, and because it's got software and it connects to the computer, there's a whole nother level of just like this can just not work. Um, so the complexity of the interface on, on the screen. Yeah. That it's a web yeah. browser thing. It has a web browser to, to, to configure the like controllers you know what CCs come out of it. That's just mm-hmm. um, <coughs> it's the web browser. It's the it's the editor from the 16N project, but just modified so it works works for my thing. Um, so with that, I, but whereas like the the um, the that mini drive thing, you know, I'm not sort of particularly. Con- I haven't done a great deal of user testing on that. No, you that, know, that seems like a really to, simple thing. That, yeah, I sent it to a couple of people and they said, yeah, it sounds nice. How does it? And it's been interesting talking to those people just about how they understand it. You know, what what do they define it as? Um, you know, I'd hate it if somebody bought it and accidentally used it as a like guitar amp, which is what it's supposed to do in the original circuit, but it doesn't, it's not good for that. <laughs> you know, it's cool if you plug like a line into it. You get you can boost it up to module level just about, and you'll get a lot of distortion on it. Uh, but if you bought it and accidentally thought that it was like a nice instrument interface, that would not be a good experience for you. I don't think. Um, so, how do you make sure that it doesn't go this way? That it's not confusing. Well, the, the original prototypes of it, I literally just had the front panel from a mini move, like graphics on it, which says external input. I was like, oh, I better not, better not do that because that is just really confusing. <laughs> so I want to make sure people don't do that. Um, and just, I think in the way, like when you make a video about it, you want to make sure the person making the video understands that it's not for that. We're not describing it as an external input anywhere. It's got like, you know, 3.5 millimeter jacks on it. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know, just the way you describe it. But I, I think is, this, this, that's a pretty straightforward thing. You know, we want to make sure, pe- make sure people understand that it is not not something it's not meant to be, I suppose. Is there, is there um, like a, sort of like a, sign, like a way to signify it with the graphics that you're considering? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a weird one as well because it's because it's it's you know it's fundamentally very simple. It doesn't. I think the, the risk would be if it had a quarter inch jack on the front, mm-hmm. which would be a big mistake. Um, uh, you know, in some ways, like there's lots of modules that you don't expect to be able to plug external signals into, so I wouldn't be suggesting using it for external signal. It's not actually going to damage anything. I just remember to try it and plug a guitar into it. It really doesn't sound very good. It doesn't write impedance and stuff for a, for a guitar signal. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting for that one, actually, because I think the way 
the way to catch it interestingly is less immediately obvious so so you know it becomes really fun when you start patching it into like feedback loops within your system and that's not an obvious thing that's not a you know it doesn't you you would need to read something about it to kind of try and make sense of that just as i think with the microphone the contact mic module again you kind of need to to think about interesting things to do with it which i didn't have those ideas before and i was just literally it'd be funny if you could hear all the switches and sockets um but as time went on people realized there were more fun things you can do with it so you can trigger those kind of rings or a kind of couple of strong thing with it and it's a lot of fun um you can use it if you trigger like cv with it you get a lot of weird freak out effect from it um so then there is definitely that thing of, of helping people to understand interesting things to do with it Whereas like a Turing machine is a lot more straightforward. You plug in a clock and you plug it into a resonator and it sounds cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the other thing I suppose I take from, from my work is trying to think of that whole purchase cycle. So from when somebody hears about something to when they've considered it, they've bought it, they've made it in the case of a DIY thing and then they use it and then they become an advocate for it. You sort of, in the back of your mind, want to make sure that at each point, they're going to have a happy experience of that. And I think that's something that, that me and me and Steve and Fung will, will very intuitively, well, not intuitively, you learn it from things like when you go to a trade show or you go to, to um, Brighton Modular Move and put there something, you see what things people can understand in that environment, what things they can't understand in that environment. Like when I made a, like a spring reverb module, which you know works well and is, is successful, um, but it's quite a subtle thing. You know, it does sound really good. It's a really interesting module, and it has feedback loop built into it, which is really nice when you use it subtly. You know, to just of kind of glow around what you're doing and when you're at home and you're listening to that and you're playing with it it's really interesting and subtle try and do that on the floor like a fat workshop or a super <laughs> you can't do that um so which people will do something important and you definitely you know it's where you get you know kind of people developing um, mass market kind of synthesizers is how do I, I need to turn it on and press a key and hear something cool straight away. And all of those kind of 80s big synthesizers that had these incredible patches that, that you just pressed it, you know, this whole kind of world of like rhythms and sound and pads and everything, which I think sold them a lot of synths, but I don't know if it actually, um, uh, they, they then end up getting used for that kind of core game one piano sound for their lifetime. Well, DX7 got used for its DX piano sound. <laughs> um, but it was the kind of the, the magic of the thing that you have that instant gratification compared with something that's useful long term. And I think in DIY world, you have again that the experience of building it versus the experience of owning it and using it, which is slightly slightly distinct um and you always i always kind of worry about you don't necessarily want something to be too simple to build so there's really kind of nothing to do there's nothing distinctive or memorable to do um but you definitely want to be too difficult to build because it's just painful and unpleasant yeah so there's a kind of interesting balance there I think what's interesting what what you said is is that you're really thinking about like on one hand you're saying I'm not really a customer centered but at the same time you're like it's very important for me that 
from the moment of uh, uh, like seeing the video or uh, a picture of the instrument and then going to the point of like deciding I want to buy it and then building it and then playing it and then becoming an advocate to it. You really want to design these uh, um, experiences for them. So yeah. they are really meaningful. And that to me is really like is very customer centered or like I would say yeah. user centered, just person, human, human centered. Yeah, definitely, definitely on that, and, and, and that's definitely what I what I want to do. I don't want to make something where I can say, "Yeah, well, my art is correct. You are wrong." You know, I'm not <laughs> interested in, in doing that. I'm interested in. I'm the only person who wants this, and ten other people might want it, and that's that's fine, as long as those ten other people enjoy it. But I'm not interested in. This is my art, you know, get lost. But I think, uh, and I and I suppose, yeah, maybe maybe it's just trying, it's, it's trying to really think that stuff through rather than, uh, there are ways of optimizing for different parts of the process. So you can optimize for somebody looking at a list of the features that are part of the thing, you know, and there are, there are products that do that very successfully. There are projects, there are music devices that do that successfully. You can look down a checklist and you can go, okay, that's got all those things. That's cool. I'm going to buy that. Um, but I said, I'm always personally slightly skeptical about that approach. I'd be much more like, I want something that can do one thing really well, which is a very luxury, nice, you know, middle class problem to have. <laughs> um, but I suppose it's also because we all have a universal device at all times. So I'm talking to you through the universal device that I write on and I work on and I, you know, all of those things. Um, and if I want, to, if I deliberately want to make music for some purpose, that universal device is much, much better than any of this hardware nonsense that we use. No, it's not. You know, the, the, if, you, if, you, if your job is professionally making music all day long, you will use computers and software and that will be much more effective and it will work. Yes. And I think, you know, that's, uh, pretending otherwise is, 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 is foolish. And I think... It's so interesting when you look back at people living in the 70s now and the experience, 70s, 80s, you know, even up to sort of 90s, having the experience of having frustrating, difficult music making experiences and expensive music making experiences. Yeah, you know, I was listening to the, there's an amazing um, podcast about uh, the history of the Prince album, Purple Rain. The, well, sorry, the, history of? The, the, the Prince album, sorry, Sign of the Times. So Prince made an album, Sign of the Times. There's a podcast about his process recording that album over like three years. Mm -hmm. And they've interviewed everyone who worked on it pretty much, apart from obviously Prince. And it's done with the Prince estate. And there's bits in there where his, his engineer, Susan Rogers, is describing she's wiring up his home studio yet. She's literally soldering the console together while he's just like sitting there, you know, frustrated. Like she can hear him upstairs writing Purple Rain, <laughs> like on the piano. And he's just like, Susan, have you finished? Have you finished? I need to get in, I need to record. <laughs> and she's like, I've got just to imagine. connect this stuff together. Uh, and that, was the way music was for, for 20, 30, 40 years of recorded history. Now that's gone. Now Prince, if he was in that situation, he'd be able to record it on his laptop or do whatever. Oh, um, sure. But, but that's why for, uh, as a sort of luxury, quirky, weird, interesting product, uh, you know, this music hardware stuff has become interesting. But I think, you know, we shouldn't, shouldn't ever pretend that there's something other than that. You know, and you can do it all on, if you really want to do quirky, difficult, modular synth things, you could do it all for free on, on VCC rack, VC, on the rack VC, thing, yeah. VCV rack. Yeah. VCV rack, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I completely agree. 
I think that our role as people who design things for other people is to create experiences that are meaningful. Um, if you can create an experience that is community-based, that's even like a higher level of, of creating an experience. I find it uh, like genuinely super inspiring when I just sit with a few students and we make something, they make something and I just, I observe, I sort of like make sure they don't fall into like too severe of a pitfall. But other than that, they should just play around and fail. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really exciting because at the end of it, you really you make uh, you make relationships with other people just because you create an ex an experience for them. Um, yeah, there is also a uh, uh, Mangchi. Also, I read I read an interview. It's funny that I uh, bring him up uh, twice in this conversation. Uh, but he made he said something really beautiful in an interview. Uh, I think it was a uh, waveform uh, uh, interviewed him, and he was saying that. Um, when you're creating a, a complete instrument, so not a modular instrument, you are uh, um, you're connecting people together <laughs> simply because they are going to be sharing their own experience and the way that they are uh, using it, uh, sharing tutorials or sharing. Uh, I've been thinking right away on about uh, uh, Ben uh, DivKid, in that sense. I, I I can vividly remember myself looking at his early videos, not understanding anything of what he said, and then listening to like later videos, and he really became like it's 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 he's not talking about functions anymore. He's the, just this brilliant musician that is trying to show you how creative you could go with this thing, and all of a sudden you feel really inspired and you want to have it because you also want to make that thing that he made as well. And then all of a sudden you see him somewhere because you go to the same conference and you talk about that thing. And this creates a community of an experience that is uh, rich and exciting and, and yeah, and inspiring. And I think that's really the main thing here. It's not about the efficiency of something. The efficiency obviously is in this box that we're talking through uh, at the moment, but then when I look at this, I remember when I was looking for exactly this, I was just really looking for exactly this. And then all of a sudden I was like, this is it. And it's dirt cheap and I can own it. And then I can create that thing that I have in mind because my case was an Ikea box <laughs> that I made with, um, with my father, my, with my father actually in Israel. And it just has two 12, 12, uh, um, 12 volt power supplies inverted. <laughs> um, and and this was perfect. This was perfect. And this was dirt cheap. This is literally like seven euros with two boxes of 12 volts that I just had at home. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's, that's actually a pretty uh, uh, interesting ending for our conversation. <laughs> um, I think this was this was really useful. Uh, there were a bunch of things that uh, that I found uh, very inspiring in what you said uh, about how you look at the process and how you come up with ideas and also the 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 screen that you shared with a bunch of examples that are definitely going to be super useful. Uh, I'm sure for students to to really understand what could be the process. Um, and I'm I'm curious about that uh, mini drive uh, thing. I'm very, very curious about this, especially I'm, I'm actually really curious if if there is a way like you were talking about the, the, the feedback thing. And if there was if there would be a way to explain this without Ben showing it on his video, but like just like there is something on the interface that you don't need a manual or anything. It's it's stupid, simple, but there is this icon or like a line or something that all of a sudden makes it like right, this makes a lot of sense. I should probably plug this this way. Part of it is it has, it deliberately has two inputs and two outputs. So I hope people look at it and go, hmm, I should plug something else into that. <laughs> <laughs>